introduce our 2019 presenter, Dave F. Oh. All right. Good morning. I'm Dave Fredrickson. I am an alcoholic. Hey. I'm a recovered alcoholic. For those of you who don't know what that means, is I am recovered from a hopeless state of mind and body. <clears throat> and I'm glad to be here with you guys. Um, if you came in late, the bottom link, you want to log on to that, and that has your uh, all the resources you're going to need. Um, it takes you to, to a server on Mediafire that has a, uh, there's a file called uh, step, step Worksheets. Everything that you're going to see in this presentation about the short form and the fear inventory and the sex inventory, I've made forms to make it easy to fill out to do those steps very quickly. There's a whole folder with PDFs full of those worksheets. <clears throat> there's also a set of notes. It's almost 50 pages long uh, that covers everything you need. So you don't really need to take notes. <clears throat> you know, one of the things I found from doing dozens and dozens and dozens of workshops is people are so busy writing that they don't pay attention to what's going on. Then you get a lot of, what was that you said? <laughs> you know? So to save time, we're gonna, you know, I put together the notes. Uh, another thing you'll notice is uh, I always give a page and then a colon and the, and the paragraph number. Just kind of like when you're looking at a Bible, it's the same kind of a thing. I use a study edition of the big book, uh, which is a third, I use a third edition because I got sober in 1981. Fourth edition didn't exist. So if you have a fourth edition, when you're looking at uh, pages from uh, uh, the Roman numeral pages from the doctor's opinion and stuff, your references will be off by two pages because the fourth edition added two more forwards. So it kind of screws up those numbers. Uh, why they allowed the, those numbers to be changed, I don't know. In the first edition of the big book, the doctor's opinion was page one. It wasn't Roman numerals. And ever since then, every time they change a new edition of the big book, it makes doing this work crazy. Uh, <clears throat> so um, if there's a paragraph that continues over from a previous page, that's colon zero. The first full paragraph is colon one, second full paragraph is colon two, so you can find it as it goes through. Uh, I do the same thing for the 12 and 12. There's not too many references to the 12 and 12 in my notes, but when there is something really important, I put that in there and it's the same format. It's the page number, colon, whatever paragraph it is to go through. Is there anybody here that's in their first 30 days of recovery? Yes, ma'am. Is this your first run through the steps? Good. Okay. So there's no really newbies. One of the things I like to, to make sure is if there's somebody that's brand new, to give them the warning, they're going to be drinking from a fire hose. This presentation, I knew I was coming, I was coming to my people. You guys are a bunch of thumpers in here, you know. So I set this thing up um, and for people more of it as a tool to help, ta help you take others through the work, you know, so that you can go through and have your own experience, but especially so that you know what pages and paragraphs that are, are do not miss. As a matter of fact, in the, in the back of the notes, I've had so many people asking me, uh, matter of fact, Cody was one of them. <laughs> was nagging me. Hey, what pages do you make sure you cover when you take somebody through the work? Uh, there's a list of the, the absolute must-hit pages and kind of the sessions. When I take somebody through on the internet, there's, I break it up kind of in sessions. And so I'll, I'll take them through a certain number of, of pages and then I'll give them a homework assignment and say, on our next session, we'll, we'll jump in, we'll start here. And we go through. Uh, <clears throat> so um, it's, a, it's about as a complete a reference as you're going to find for, for working with others, I hope. Um, uh, as we go through. Uh, the big book is unfortunately written with Bill Wilson in mind, so he uses he a lot. Don't take offense to that. This is a gender, gender neutral set of steps. You know, Just because I'm not saying he or she, understand that it applies to women too, and I'm not prejudiced against anybody or anything. So you know, if, if you get mad at me when I keep saying he or him, Please understand it's just because that's what my frame of reference is the big book and that's what we have to deal with. If we could change it, I would, but we can't. Um, so <clears throat> when I meet somebody new, right, and we sit down with the big book, one of the very first things I do is I give him a big book. I buy his big book for him, make sure he's got one so he doesn't have to steal one from the home group. And, <clears throat> and then I tell him, read this thing, right? That's pretty much where you start. Hard to find somebody that hasn't been to retread, that hasn't been to another meeting, that doesn't already have a big book. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's their coaster for their beer, but they've got a book, 
you know, the question is, have you read the damn thing? I tell them, I just want you to read through it. I don't expect you to remember anything. There's not going to be notes or tests on the damn thing. I want you to be familiar with it. So when I get there, it's not the first time you're hearing it. Did you kind of go, oh, yeah, I remember reading that. And it kind of triggers something in your mind as you go through. Uh, don't assume people can read. When I first got to Alcoholics Anonymous, I had done so poorly in school, and I, had a, I didn't realize it, but I had a de- reading disability. And so when they would ask somebody to read like the, how it works or something, that was, would put the fear of God into me because I read it about a, you know, a second grade level at maybe at, at best when I got here. I've run into a number of people that are illiterate in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, so I make sure they have a reference. You know, if I need to, I'll give them a, a, a recorder with cassette tapes or a CD player with CDs so that they can hear the big book, the, the big book and the 12 and 12 are available in audio, you know, <clears throat> um, so that they can make sure they get the message. And I've even done it where I've sat down with people and I've read the book to them because they, they, they even audio there, they've got so many different issues going on that they can't focus enough to even listen to an audio tape. I'm like, okay, that's fine. We'll sit down we go through we, and I read to them and then we talk about what I've read to them and What's cool about that is they don't even realize they're going through the steps while you're going through the steps because you're just talking about it and you're like, hey, and while they're describing it to me, I got a piece of paper right there and, and literally we do their fourth step and they don't write a damn thing. I write the whole thing for them. But when it comes time to pray, we say the prayers together. I ask them to say a prayer the best they can, you know, and we go through the work and they stay sober. It's a really cool deal. So it doesn't matter what the issue is as the person that's carrying the message. It's our job to make sure we lay the spiritual toolkit at their feet. It's their job to pick up the toolkit, but it doesn't do us any good if we lay a tool down that they can't pick up. It's my point. So make sure that the people you're working with can pick up the tool. <clears throat> any questions on that before I keep, keep on going? Cool, so <clears throat> the whole premise is, it starts out with, uh, where's my clicker? Boom. There's three pieces to step one, right? So you're gonna start out at step one. And the first thing I do is I have the guy read the forwards to the first edition and, you know, and, and we talk about you know, the forward to the first edition we're in there. It, it, it talks about you know, we are 100 men and women who have recovered from a hopeless state of mind and body. And we talk about what does that mean, recovered from a hopeless state of mind and body. And I, I give them their first dip in the pool and I say, you know, there's, there's two really major pieces of our disease that, that, that we have a problem with. So there's really three pieces, but the two major pieces our physical craving, when we pick up a drink, the drink takes a drink. It wants to drink your next drink. It's always asking us, once you put that poison in your body, it wants more. And I said, so that's the, that's the physical piece. And I said, if you don't have the physical craving anymore, you're recovered from that piece of the deal. And I said, the second piece we have is the mental obsession, where we're always thinking about, where am I going to get my next drink? How am I going to get my next drink? What's going on with that? How long is this bottle going to last? That constant thought, or when we don't have a bottle, it's where am I going to get my next one? Oh my gosh, what day of the week is it? Is the liquor store open on Sundays? Am I in a dry county? You know, that thought process is a mental obsession where we can't, it drowns out all the rest of the things that we're supposed to be doing and our focus is on, in our mind, on alcohol. And if that's not going on, if you don't have physical craving because you haven't put it in your body and you don't have mental obsession, you're in as recovered a state as you're going to get. And I, then I tell them, but there's a third piece that, that we never get better from, and that's the spiritual malady. And we work on that one day at a time. Every day we work on the spiritual piece because <clears throat> that's the, the piece that constantly needs more attention to bring us closer to God. And I've yet to run into somebody when I explain it that way that doesn't understand what the hell I'm talking about. And they understand, okay, I can focus on one thing. If I have to focus on three things, forget about it. Most of us are too ADD. It's, you know, like squirrel. You know, there are, our minds go off. You know, but if you give them one thing to focus on, they can focus on the one thing. And that gets me already talking about spirituality. I'm talking to the guy for maybe three to five minutes, and I'm already mentioning the spiritual issue and talking about a power greater than myself, you know. And people say, well, you can't talk to people about God that early. And I go, yeah, you can. Because if me mentioning a power greater than yourself, if you've got a problem with that and it scares you away from Alcoholics Anonymous, guess what? Alcohol will scare you right back. Once you've been beaten down enough, it doesn't matter what we're talking about. You could care less. You could talk politics and we don't care less. You know, that's not going to be enough to drive you away when you finally have the gift of desperation. All right. So the three pieces of, uh, of, the, of the program, right? We already talked about the body. It's the physical craving. There's the mind, the mental obsession, and there's the spiritual malady. So when I lead you through this, I'm going to be kind of looking at that because that's the way it's laid out in our book. The beginning of the book starts with Dr. Silkworth. And hopefully all of you know who Dr. Silkworth was. 
You know, when the book was written in 1935, Dr. Silkworth was the world's preeminent expert on alcoholism. Because back then, if you had an alcohol issue, they considered it a moral issue. They didn't consider it a disease. It, that conception hadn't even really come into, into popularity yet, that there was something like a physical disease that was going on here. So if you had an alcohol issue and you went to court, the judge would sentence you to a sanitarium because he'd have you locked up in the sanitarium. The sanitarium is the front half of a nut ward. You know, if you, you've seen it on, anybody see uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest? You know, the, the day room where everybody's wearing the pajamas and their slippers, that's the sanitarium because you're not a threat to, your, to anybody else or yourself, but you can't, you're not free to go out into society because there's something wrong with you. They, they put you in there and you just kind of hang out and they put you on Thorazine, you do the Thorazine shuffle and you know, you're, they basically just warehouse you to keep you out of society, keep the problem away. That's what they would do for alcoholics back when Bill Wilson's day, right? There was only really three places on the planet that you could get treated for alcoholism. New York, Paris, and London, where they had these hospitals that were really advanced and they were trying to figure out what can we do with these alcoholics? Well, there's got to be something going on here that we don't see. <clears throat> you know? And Dr. Silkworth was a, uh, a neurologist by trade, right? And when the stock mar market crashed in the 30s, he lost his practice. And so he needed a, a job. Well, neurology and psychiatry are kissing cousins. You know? And so he applied at Towns Hospital in New York and got the job as the chief psychiatrist for this alcoholic ward. And so he started working with alcoholics. And according to our history books, he worked with over 50,000 alcoholics. And it was his pet theory that alcoholics had something wrong with them that was this allergy. And so when he wrote the first, uh, the first part of our book for us and gave it to us, it was so unique a theory that he didn't sign his name to it. It was an anonymous doctor. If you look at the first edition, it says an anonymous doctor. By the time the second edition came around in 1955, everybody had kind of embraced it and said, yeah, this was really truly a, a real deal. And the medical community had, had embraced it. And he's allowed us to use his name in the second edition and on forward. But in the very beginning, it was his own pet theory. And he was afraid they were going to tar and feather him, run him out of the business, you know? And, and so it, it was really groundbreaking, you know? Um, in my opinion, it was, you know, God inspired, you know, that all the, the pieces came together as they came. All right. <clears throat> so what makes somebody an alcoholic? All right. <clears throat> Oops, let me click my thing so I can see it. I can't see, I thought I would have the computer right next to me and it has to be back over there. So you're gonna have to bear with me as I manually go through this sucker. Come on. I hate technology. There we go. So what makes somebody an alcoholic? And the question that I ask is, is there more than one kind of alcoholic? Most people, when they walk through the door, if they even know they're an alcoholic, they think there's only one kind. Believe it or not, our big book gives 12 different kinds of alcoholics. And we'll, I'm going to share that to you as we go through. All right. <clears throat> so what does the big book say about that? Right? All right. The first piece that we're going to talk about is the craving. It's the body. From page XXVI, if you're working with the fourth edition, it would be XXVIII. Uh, first paragraph, it says, we believe and so suggested a few years ago that the action of alcohol on these chronic alcoholics... Chronic alcoholic is a type of alcoholic, right? In medical terms, there's two major categories that they talk about, chronic and acute, right? The difference between chronic and acute, and the, the example that I like to use, oops, did I not click it forward? There we go. Now you guys can see what I'm talking about. Uh, the difference in, in between chronic and acute, the example I like to use is the, in, the, is the influenza, right? It's the flu. Every, every winter we go through the flu season, right? Well, the, few, the flu is an acute disease. Right? So if you don't get your flu shot and you happen to catch the flu, there's a progression to the disease. The first thing that starts to happen is you, are, you, you get kind of achy and creaky. Right? Your body starts to hurt. Then you start to get a temperature and a fever. Then you start to vomit or have diarrhea. Right? And if the disease doesn't kill you, then you get better over time, you know, four or five days later. Most people don't realize, last year I think we, we, uh, influenza killed 18,000 people in the United States. It is a fatal progressive disease. Right? but it's a short-term disease. That's why it's an acute disease versus alcoholism is a chronic disease. And the only difference is chronic disease is also a fatal disease and it's a progressive disease. It has a certain pattern that it goes through, but it goes through over a long period of time. So you can start drinking early on when you're, let's say you're in your teens and, and not have an issue if you don't keep on drinking. You might have physical craving, but if you don't have mental obsession, you can go long periods of time without taking another drink. Problem is when you drink, 
it triggers craving in you. That makes you one of us. Okay? So what he's talking about here, he's talking about late stage alcoholics. A chronic alcoholic is somebody that's got to the point where they have physical craving and mental obsession. And not all alcoholics do, and I'll show that to you in a, in a little bit. So Dr. Silkworth here says, it's the manifestation of an allergy. The phenomenon of craving is limited to this class and never occurs in the average temperate drinker. Right? I like to think of it as a class, I use the example of a second grade class. In a second grade class, you got boys, you got girls, you got big kids, you got little kids, small kids, you got black kids, white kids, brown kids, yellow kids. What's the one thing they all have in common? They're all in the second grade. And what, what he's saying is craving, every alcoholic has craving. It's limited to this class, even though there's all these different kinds of alcoholics, which he doesn't go on to explain for another couple pages, right? And he says, these alcoholic types can never safely use alcohol in any form at all. And once having formed the habit, they found they cannot break it. And once having lost their self-confidence, their reliance upon human things, their problems pile up on them and become astonishingly difficult to solve. Frothy emotional appeal seldom suffices. What is frothy emotional appeal? That's when your grandmother comes to you and says, oh, honey, if you really love me, you please stop drinking for me. And we say, you know what, grandma, I love you back. And absolutely. You know, and we mean it when we say you could pass a lie detector test at 10 o'clock in the morning when you come to and she's asking you that and you say, yeah, I won't take a drink. But before the sun goes down, you're drinking. Did you lie to her earlier? No, you didn't lie. Your intention was never to touch a drop. But we were making a promise that we can't keep. Right. So it doesn't suffice, you know, for the emotional appeal. The message which can hold in. Uh, interest in hold these alcoholics must have depth and weight. In nearly all, I, uh, that's, that's the next sentence. I cut it off. Never mind. That was a bad slide. Cool. All right. So we've got our first kind of alcoholic. Right. <clears throat> now we're going to look at see if we can find some more alcoholics from XXVIII, paragraph two. It says the classification of alcoholics seems most difficult and in much detail outside the scope of this book. There are, of course, the psychopaths. Here's alcoholic number two. They were emotionally unstable. We're all familiar with this type. They are always going on the wagon for keeps. They're over remorseful, make many resolutions, but never a decision. What decision? Third step decision, right? To turn their will and life over to God, right? I don't know about you, but any, any psychopaths in here? I was certainly a psychopath, right? <clears throat> um, there's a type of man who's unwilling to admit, here comes alcoholic number three, that he cannot take a drink. He plans various ways of drinking, changes his brand or his environment. Any of those in here? Yeah. And the cool thing is you can start to identify with more than one kind of alcoholic, can't you? If, if you go, as you go through, which means you may have unique characteristics that are unique to you and not to anybody else. But what's the one characteristic we all have? Physical craving, right? <clears throat> uh, there is <clears throat> the type who always believes that being entirely free from alcohol for a period of time, he can drink without danger, right? That's the periodic alcoholic. If I just don't drink and he goes six months, he doesn't drink, and then all of a sudden he tries to drink again, that was Dr. Bob. You know, Dr. Bob was in the Oxford group for two years before I ever met Bill Wilson. Ann Smith was a power broker in the Oxford group, Dr. Bob's wife, and she had introduced him. And Dr. Bob would use the six steps of the Oxford group to stay sober. And he'd stay sober for like five, six months. And he'd think, man, I finally got it. And then he'd go have a beer and he'd be off to the races again. And he couldn't figure it out, right? Because the magic that Bill Wilson brought to Dr. Bob was Dr. Silkworth's craving. He, even though he was a medical doctor, he'd never heard that before. And he didn't understand it's the first drink that gets you drunk because that's what triggers the craving. You know? So Dr. Bob was one of these uh, uh, periodic alcoholics. You know? <clears throat> uh, he could stay sober with the, Ox with the Oxford group steps, but he, he couldn't maintain it because he kept going back to the bottle. Then there's the manic depressive type who is, uh, is perhaps the least understood by his friends and about whom a whole chapter could be written. Right? So that's, what is that number? One, two, three, four, five types, right? Anybody heard of a normal alcoholic? Here's alcoholic number six. Then there are the types who are entirely normal in every respect, except for the effect alcohol has upon them. They are often able, intelligent, and friendly people. Primarily, these are the kind of alcoholics that you'll see in Alcoholics Anonymous these days. They're, they're upwardly mobile professionals. They, they seem to be making some strides at work. And then all of a sudden, they have a, a dumb shit at a Christmas party, or they get a DWI, and the judge says, hey, go to AA. And they come walking through the door. And you know they seem to be functional in every other way, except when they drink. And then they, that gets them into trouble. And they don't have the gift of desperation. They're really tough people to work with. And that, I think that's one of the reasons we get the revolving door a lot, because they haven't fe felt the nip of the ringer. They haven't really got into deep trouble yet because they're pretty much normal, and it's our job to help convince them that, hey, if you've got physical craving, it's only a matter of time until you're gonna get a mental obsession and you're gonna be 
really screwed. So you might as well quit now. You know, <clears throat> anyway, I digress. All right, all these and many others have one symptom in common. They cannot start drinking without developing the phenomenon of craving. This phenomenon, we suggested, may be the manifestation of an allergy which differentiates these people and sets them apart as a distinct entity. It has never been, by any treatment with which we are familiar, permanently eradicated. All right? Physical craving is the deal. You know? How many people have been in a meeting and said, everybody's got a different bottom? Yeah. That's what I was told when I first got here, except by my sponsor. And he says, I don't think that everybody's got a different bottom. He says, we all have the same bottom. It's physical craving. A normal person, a normal human being, what's the normal thing that happens to a, to a human being when they drink alcohol? You take a little kid, and the first time they drink alcohol, what happens? They get sick to their stomach and they puke. The human body knows that alcohol is a central nervous system depressant poison. It's the only legal poison sold in the planet is alcohol, right? But at a certain point in your drinking, for us, our body, instead of getting rid of it and says, I can't take that anymore, it says, what was that? Oh, that felt good. Give me more of that. Now we got craving, right? At that point, you are condemned. You've got the disease of alcoholism. You've got craving. And if you, every single time you touch alcohol, you're walking into the danger zone. It doesn't matter whether you have mental obsession yet or not. If you got physical craving, you're broken, you're one of us. Literally, now when we have neuroscience to look inside the brain, we actually understand that literally you, what you've done is permanently rewired your brain and your pleasure center in your brain, and it can't be un unwired. So Dr. Silkworth's theory about, uh, about physical craving was 100% accurate. We have not found anything to disprove his theory. It's spot on, <clears throat> but I digress. What do we got next? Let's see. What does that say? The real alcoholic. Here we go. Next page. JR. <clears throat> JR loves this. He, he identifies this, right? 21 1. But what about the real alcoholic, right? He may start off as a moderate drinker. He may not become a continuous drinker. But at some stage in his drinking career, he begins to lose all control of his liquor consumption once he starts to drink. There is the fellow who's been puzzling you, especially by his lack of control. He does absurd, incredible, tragic things while drinking. He's real Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. He's seldom mildly intoxicated. He's always more or less insanely drunk. His business disposition while drinking resembles his normal nature, but little. He may be one of the most finest fellows in the world, yet let him drink for a day, and he frequently becomes distinguishedly and even dangerously antisocial. He has a positive genius for getting tight at exactly the wrong moment, particularly when some important decision has to be made or engagement kept. He's often perfectly sensible and well-balanced concerning everything except liquor. But in that respect, he's incredibly dishonest and selfish. He often possesses special abilities, skills, aptitudes, and has a promising career ahead of him. This is by no means a comprehensive picture of the true alcoholic, as our behavior patterns vary. What is he saying there? He's saying you may fit this category, but our behavior patterns vary, because he knows there's a whole bunch of different kinds of alcoholics. He's just talking about one kind here. But this description should, should identify him roughly. So if you can identify with this, come on in, the water's fine, you're one of us. But if you can't identify with this, if you've got physical craving, you're just a different kind of alcoholic. You're still one of us. Come on in. The water's fine. The only thing that differentiates us from the earth people is the fact that we have physical craving. Right? Now, time is the other factor. Even though you get an alcoholic who only has physical craving, and we're going to read about it later on, they talk about periodic alcoholics, about young kids and, and women, it is, is his description that he uses. He says they may be periodic alcoholics, meaning that they only have physical craving. So when they drink, craving takes over and they do stupid things and they get into trouble. But they haven't, the disease hasn't progressed enough to where they have mental obsession yet. So there's nothing to force them to continue drinking. So they put the drink down, they go, oh my gosh, I'm embarrassed. They, they may even go years. There's that story in the big book about the guy who, who gets himself into trouble and he says, you know what, I, drinking and me don't mix. And so he doesn't drink his entire career. But when he retires, he starts drinking again, puts on his his uh, pajamas and his slippers and he's dead within three years. What happened was he only had physical craving at the beginning. He worked his whole career, but his disease continued. Even though he wasn't drinking actively, his disease was getting worse, right? And so when he started picking up after he retired, all of a sudden, bang, he's got mental obsession. He drinks himself to death, you know, not uncommon. So the distinguishing factor for alcoholics is physical craving, period, and it stop. If you have mental obsession, it just means you're a later stage. You've got physical craving, and now you've also got something else. And it's a lovely little piece that really drives you crazy when you get mental obsession. Uh, <clears throat> anybody that's been there knows what I'm talking about. 24-4. <clears throat> 
The fact is that most alcoholics, for reason yet obscure, have lost the power of choice in drink. Our so-called willpower becomes practically non-existent. We are unable at certain times to bring into our consciousness with sufficient memory the suffering and humiliation of even a week or a month ago. We are without defense against the first drink. The almost certain consequences of following taking even a glass of beer do not crowd our mind to deter us. If these thoughts occur, they are hazy and readily supplanted with the old threadbare idea that this time we shall handle ourselves like other people. There is that complete failure of the kind of defense that keeps one from putting his hand on a hot stove. The alcoholic may say to himself in the most casual way, it won't burn me this time, here's how, or perhaps he doesn't think at all. How often some of us have begun to drink in this nonchalant way, and after the third or fourth pounded on the bar and said to ourselves, for God's sake, how did I ever get started again? Only to have the thought supplanted by, well, I'll stop with the sixth drink, or what the hell's the use anyway? When this sort of thinking is fully established in an ind individual with alcoholic tendencies, he has probably placed himself beyond human aid and must locked up, must go, uh, may die or go permanently insane. Here's another kind of alcoholic. He's got alcoholic tendencies. When he drinks, he drinks to excess. Doesn't know how he started drinking. He doesn't remember the pain of a week or a month ago. But once he starts, He's like, well, screw it. I'm already down this path. Let's, we're going to ride this pony until, I, until you know, we run out of money or run out of booze you know, or run out of consciousness. And, oh, and then when he wakes up, he's guilty and remorseful, and he says, I'm not going to do that again. But because he doesn't have mental obsession, he's only got alcoholic tendencies, he can put it down and go for another period of time until the next time he's stupid enough to pick it back up. Does that make sense? Cool. Potential alcoholics. This is what I was talking about, potential alcoholics. To be uh, gravely affected, one does not necessarily have to drink for a long period nor take the quantities of some of us. This is particularly true of women. Potential female alcoholics often turn into the real thing and are gone beyond recall in a few years. Certain drinkers who would be greatly insulted if called alcoholics are astonished at their inability to stop. We, who are familiar with the symptoms, see large numbers of potential alcoholics among young people everywhere. You know? I was a potential alcoholic when I first started, when I was like 13. By the time I was 15, I was a full-blown mental obsession, hard driving, had to drink every day, alcoholic. You know, <clears throat> potential alcoholic. Though you may be able to stop for a considerable period, you may yet be a potential alcoholic. We think few to whom this book will appeal can stay dry anything like a year. Some will be drunk the day after making their resolution, most of them within a few weeks. Right? Did I forget to switch the slide? Cool. Oh, there we go. If you guys don't see what I'm reading, yell at me. It means I didn't hit the, hit the button. You're with me now. Okay. Cool. <clears throat> so when I get a guy up to this point, I've, I don't go through all 12 different kinds of alcohol. I just want to make the point to him that there's these various different kinds. And then we have a conversation. What kind of alcoholic are you? Which one of these symptoms do you identify with? And I let him explain to me what he's identifying with. The interesting thing that Bill Wilson understood was, and he got it from, doc, from uh, Dr. Silkworth, was the progression. One of the things that I personally have experienced dealing with alcoholics is a lot of us can identify with mental obsession, but we have a hard time identifying with craving because we don't even realize that it's occurring when it's going on. Bill Wilson knew that there's a progression to the disease. Everybody starts with craving. That's what makes us alcoholic. And as you start down the path over time, by the time you get to mental obsession, you're conscious of the mental obsession because you can't get the thought of, where am I going to get my next drink? He said, so later on, when you get to page, I think it's 30, where he's talking about, you know, if when you honestly want to, you can't quit entirely, you know, and he goes through that, that piece. What he's describing is, if you have mental obsession or physical craving, you're one of us. Because he knew that you can't have mental obsession without having had physical craving. That's how the, the disease works. And the, the thing that I have personally experienced is most people will identify with mental obsession. They may not always identify with physical craving. So by having this conversation with them, what do you identify with? What makes sense to you? Do, do, have you ever experienced this stuff? You can go through and ask them some relevant questions and they kind of wake up to it and they go, oh, you know what? I never really thought about it. Yeah, I did. I was at that college party and I, I only meant to have two and I ended up having six and my buddies had to carry me home. Was that craving? You're like, yeah, that was craving. Because, you know, you said you're only going to have two, and then you end up having six. What caused that? You know, and sometimes you have to give them five or six examples of that. But the only way to find out what those examples even exist is by questioning and asking them, tell me about your drinking. It also bonds you to the person you're carrying the message to because you're letting them talk. You've been doing a lot of talking, and now you're giving them a chance to talk. And as alcoholics, what do we like? What's our favorite subject in the entire planet? Us. There we go. You're in the right place. 
All right. <clears throat> so once I've established that about the, the, the about that, in in the scheme of things, right now we're getting up to, um, in in the book to some pages where there's some information. I wish it was written differently, but it's not. So some of the references that come up as we're going through, I stop my my twelve step work, if you will, and I I take them to different places of the book. When I hit the first construction reference, when you when you get to your fifth step, right? After your fifth step, there's the quiet hour. And the instructions for the quiet, quiet hour, as we go back, we review the first five steps, make sure we haven't missed anything, that we've done them correctly. And then we review our construction references. Well, if you don't know what the construction references are, they're, what are they supposed to do in their quiet hour? So I take a break right here and I say, let's go to page 75 and I have them write down all these references for the construction references. And we'll talk about it when we get there and when we need it, but I want you to just make sure that it's in your book where you need it to be in your book. And then I go back and continue on talking about physical craving. Does that make sense? So we're going to follow that, that MO. All right. <clears throat> the first reference is from page 12, and it's the foundation. It was only a matter of being willing to believe the power in ourselves. Nothing more was required for me to make a beginning. I saw that growth could start from this point upon a foundation of complete willingness. I might build what I saw in my friend. Would I have it? Of course I would. All right. <clears throat> Anybody that's done any, any construction in here, and when you build a building, the most important thing about the building is having a solid foundation. If you don't have a solid foundation, the whole thing goes to hell, right? Over time, the, the foundation starts to sag, the whole building sags, because it's sitting on top of it. It's critically important to have a foundation, all right? <clears throat> uh, but what's interesting is the foundation itself isn't just a foundation. Underneath the foundation, there's something else. There's a footing, right? A wall, you know, is basically three and a half inches thick. Some, of, some old buildings, it's four inches thick, right? All the weight from the roof transfers to the wall, and all that comes down onto four inches. A lot of weight on four inches isn't a whole lot. So underneath that, they put a footing. It's usually 18 inches wide. It's a piece of concrete that they pour that's fairly deep to spread the weight of all that of the building as it comes down to hit the ground, and then it goes into the footing, and it spreads that weight out so the whole building doesn't sag over time. And if you're really good, if you can, you like in Manhattan, the, to build the skyscrapers, skyscrapers aren't attached to footings. They have pilings. They drill right down through the ground, way deep. They drill and drill and drill until they hit bedrock. And they connect to the rock of the earth. Which is, so if you're going to build the strongest buildings, you connect to bedrock. If you can't hit bedrock, if it's too deep to hit bedrock, you put in a footing. You know? And then on top of that, you put your foundation and you build your building. Does that make sense? <clears throat> The reason I'm going through this description is to save, save time. Then you got your footing, right? The very first thing that you come along, any masons in the room? No? The very first thing that a mason does when he sets a building up is he puts the first brick, right? They call it a cornerstone. You go to a corner of the building and you set the cornerstone. Why? Because the entire building is built off of that stone. That stone has to be absolutely level, square, and true because everything else is going to be referenced off that stone. Because when you lay your second stone, you make sure that it lines up with the first stone. So it's crucially important to make sure the cornerstone is in place. And in old buildings, that's the stone that has the, the date on it. When you look around in a building, there'll be a cornerstone, and it's got the date of when they put the building up on it. That's how important that stone was, right? <clears throat> it's also a biblical reference. In the Bible, they talk about Jesus being the cornerstone. So it was because the Oxford group was first century Christian principles, there was also making kind of a subtle play when we start looking at these construction reference because they were talking about Christian principles and they wanted to make reference to a cornerstone. Then there's something called the keystone. Anybody ever see an arch of stones? At the top, there's a stone that's got two angled sides. And so the stones come up and then they curve in. And as they curve in, if without something in between them, they would fall in on top of each other. So they build it as they curve in, and at the very top, they put a stone that's got two slanted angles on it so that the outside stones can lean against each other, and it locks it in, and gravity pulls it down, and it forms an arch. That's how the Romans were able to build the aqueducts, was they, they built these arches with a keystone at the top of it. And so one of our other construction references is the keystone. If the keystone isn't there, you yank out a keystone, guess what happens? <laughs> the whole thing collapses. It makes quite a mess. So what, we're, what Bill Wilson's making reference to is a spiritual arch through which we're going to pass to freedom. So now that you know the references, we'll go through and see where they are. All right. Normally, when I do a workshop, I don't have this next reference in here. I give it as a, as a take-home you know, extra credit question for the big book lawyers. 
Where's the bedrock found? It's in the 12 and 12. <clears throat> Upon entering AA, we soon take quite another view of the absolute humiliation. We perceive that only from utter defeat are we able to take our first steps towards liberation and strength. Our admission of personal powerlessness finally turn out to be firm bedrock upon which a happy and personal lives may be built. Right? Oh, there's one thing I forgot about uh, the foundation. You notice that the foundation is complete willingness. Willingness is the only thing that's referenced in all 12 steps. If you look in our literature, in, in either the big book or the 12 and 12, every single one of the steps, the word willingness is used. That's how important willingness is. Doesn't, doesn't mean you have to like it, by the way. Liking's got nothing to do with it. It just means you're willing to do it. All right. What happened? Uh-oh. Technical difficulties. Let's see if we can get this thing going. Did it go into hibernation mode? Sorry about that. Lost my clicker. There we go. Now we got our footing, guys. <coughs> Sorry about that. So, page 63, colon 1, it says footing. When we sincerely took such a position, all starts of remarkable things followed. We had a new employer. Being all-powerful, he provided what we needed. And notice this. This is a conditional statement. Anytime you see in the big book, you see the word if, pay attention to it. Because it's a conditional statement. It means if you want this promise, you're going to have to do something for it. It's not free. If we kept close to him, notice that him is capitalized. We're talking about God. And performed his work well. Also capitalized. His Established on such a footing, we became less and less interested in ourselves, our little plans and designs. That's where we get our freedom from. That's what I was doing that meditation this morning was talking about, was we got to keep close to God and then perform his work well. What does that look like? If you don't have a vision in your mind of going out and making the world a better place because you're in it, you're sober, you're not going to do it. It doesn't come naturally to us. What's our natural condition? Selfishness and self-centeredness, right? That's the root of our trouble. You know, and I hate to get political in here, but that's part of the problem with rehabs. Because they tell, what's the thing the rehab teaches? It's a selfish program. You need to take care of yourself. And I go, ah, no, it's not a selfish program. It's supposed to be a selfless program. And they're sending these people out into the world to go be selfish. Well, that's what's killing us, you know? And they're doing it without booze. There's nothing worse than a selfish individual, totally self absorbed, and they don't have alcohol. <laughs> And not to get really political, but just take one look at our president. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Outside issue, I know, I know. But, but I'm, in, in all seriousness, he comes from an alcoholic family, right? And have you noticed? Uh, everything is about him. And the, the media is always critiquing the guy because it's always about him. It's his own natural issue because he grew up in an alcoholic household. His dad and his grandfather were drunks. And so he's a, he's a walking, untreated Al Anon. You know, it's natural that, it, that, that his worldview is for about how it affects him and what's best for him. You know, I'm not making a, a, a jab at the guy. I feel bad for him because he doesn't know any better. And there's nobody there to, to help him to go through this process. We got thousands of people 
in our meetings that can help us with this who are recovered and say, hey, dude, being selfish isn't the ticket. Let's go out and help others. That's the real deal. That's where the real wealth is found. Anyway, cement, 17 colon 2. The feeling having had shared in a common peril is one element in the power of cement which binds us. Well, if there's one element, there means to be another element, right? <clears throat> but that in itself would never have held us as, uh, uh, together as we are now joined. The tremendous fact for every one of us is that we have discovered a common solution. Half common problem, half common solution. That's the cement that binds us, right? If you've ever mixed cement, you got to take sand in Portland and mix them together with a little bit of water. And if you get the ratio right, it's as strong as steel. You know, it's amazingly strong. You get the ratio wrong, it looks like cement, but you can walk up and pick it up and crumble it in your hand. It just breaks up in little teeny pieces. It's got to be the right ratio, you know? And I'm sure you've all experienced it when you go to a speaker's meeting. You get somebody up there and they're telling drunk log after drunk log after drunk log, and they go, and then I came into A and everything's been great. And they sit down and you're like, yeah. all they heard was problem, man. Where's the solution? Versus somebody who gets up there and they talk about the problem. They talk about coming into A and finding God and the cool things that have been going on in their lives. And, you know, it's like that Memorex commercial. You're just sitting there and the hair's blowing back and you're just like, oh, my God, that was awesome. You know, why? Because it's problem and solution, the combination. It's what locks us together. And you sit there and it touches your soul. And you're going, wow, I identified with that. I was that lost, and yeah, I've had an experience with God too. I'm on that exact same path. My spirit's awake, and you connect. It's, it's a really cool deal. So cement is really an important piece, and it's one of the construction references they ask us to talk about. Here comes the cornerstone. We needed to ask ourselves but one short question. Do I now believe or even willing to believe that there's a power greater than myself? As soon as a man can say he does believe or is willing to believe, we emphatically assure him that he's on his way. It has been repeatedly proven among us that upon this simple cornerstone, a wonderfully effective spiritual structure can be built. All right? It's from 47.2. Now we go to 62.3, the keystone. This is the how and the why of it. First of all, we had to quit playing God. It didn't work. Next, we decided hereafter in this drama of life, God was going to be our director. He is the principal. We are his agents. He is the father. We are his children. Most good ideas are simple. And this concept was the keystone of a new and triumphant arch through which we pass to freedom. You notice it's a concept, it's an idea, it's a way of relating, right? What they're describing here, this is the third step. This is the third step decision, right? You notice it says, <clears throat> next we decided hereafter in this drama of life, this is our third step decision. And what we hear in the rooms is, well, I turned it over to God and I took it back. I turned it over and I took it back. And what you'll hear me say is, well, you never turned it over in the first place. Because it's not an act. You're not doing something to turn it over. You're taking a conception, an idea. You're looking at it from a different way. God is gonna be my director. I'm gonna let God tell me what to do, right? He is the principal, we are his agents. I'm gonna represent God here on this earth. He's gonna be my source of power and I'm gonna be his agent. I'm gonna represent him. He is the father and I am his child. I'm gonna let him provide me, love for me, care for me, and he's gonna teach me. And if I get out of line, I expect him to, to correct me back in line. That's really what the third step is. It's a conception. We're going to have this idea of how we're going to operate in life, and we're going to live our life that way. And when you're living your life that way, then you're working for God, and who cares? You don't get a vote. You know, I have guys call me up in the morning, and they're like, oh, I, I really wanted this job, and I didn't get the job. And I'm like, whoa, stop, right there, time out. Did you find a vote this morning walking around your house? You don't get a vote. No, who asked you whether you want that job? Does God say you want that job? If God says you want that job, you're going to get that job. And if you didn't get it, guess what? God didn't want you to have it. You know, and before I have that conversation, and those of you who know me, one of the first questions that I always ask when they call me up, you know, uh, Manish knows exactly what I'm going to say. He's had this experience. He'll call me up and go, I'm really in, in a bad way. I'm having a problem. I'll say, did you pray about it? And he'll go, well, no. Next thing he hears is the dial tone. Goes, Click. <laughs> go, go talk to God. What are you calling me for? I'm not your God. You're supposed to have a power greater than yourself. Until you've gone there, I can help you interpret what you heard from God, but until your power source is not your sponsor, it's God, you know, and I will do whatever it takes to make sure they don't become dependent on me. I guarantee you that as we go through, but I digress. <clears throat> Step one, right? If you ask, if you go to a normal AA meeting and you ask people, hey, anybody in here know where, what page step one is in the big book? Most people can't tell you what page step one is on, right? It's on page 30, right? <clears throat> Most of us have been unwilling to admit that we were real alcoholics. No person likes to think that he's bodily and mentally different from his fellows. Bodily, physical craving, mentally, mental obsession, right? 
Therefore, it is not surprising that our drinking careers have been characterized by countless vain attempts to prove we could drink like other people. The idea that somehow, someday, he will control and enjoy his drinking is the great obsession of every abnormal drinker. The persistence of this illusion is astonishing. Many pursue it into the gates of insanity and death. We learned that we had to fully concede to our innermost selves that we're alcoholics. This is the first step in recovery. There it is, step one, right? The delusion that we're like other people or presently maybe has to be smashed, right? You notice that sentence doesn't say, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives have become unmanageable. That's why people don't know where it comes from, because they're used to step one from page 59, right? But here, he says, we had to fully concede to our inner ourselves. Does that mean we know we're alcoholic up here in our head? Absolutely not. I knew I was alcoholic in my head years before I ever graced the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous. I just figured, you know what, I'm going to drink until I can't drink anymore, and then when I get really bad, I'll go to A. You know? <clears throat> you know? Because I, I thought I had control over it, right? I figured I'd get right up to the precipice of that cliff, and then I'd step back and go, okay, it's time to go to A. You know? My problem, I was like, who's that, uh, that cartoon character where he goes running off the, the coyote, Wiley Coyote? You know, I've been get running out there, and I'm, I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I'm a wily <wild> coyote. <laughs> All right? Uh, anyway, next. Here's, here's my first exercise that I give to the guys, right? As we're going through, I hit two pages. I hit page 25 and hit page 30. The first one says, if you're seriously alcoholic as we were, well, how do you know if you're as seriously alcoholic as Bill Wilson in the first 100? Right? Question. We believe there's no middle of the road solution. We were in a position where life was becoming impossible. I asked the guy a question. In my big book, there's a cue after that word possible. I say, was your life becoming impossible? And then I have him answer that. And we had to pass into the region from which there is no return through human aid. We had but two alternatives. One was to go on to the bitter end, blotting out the consciousness of our intolerable situation as best we could. And the other was to ex accept spiritual help. Door number one and door number two. There is no door number three. If you've got physical craving, your disease is going to progress. It is a progressive disease, right? So if he says he's got physical craving, I'm like, uh-oh, sorry for you. <clears throat> you own this thing, and it's going to kick your butt at some point, right? Or you can accept spiritual help. Are you ready to accept the help now? Yes or no, right? That's really what we're offering. That's what we're selling here in Alcoholics Anonymous is God, a relationship with a power greater than yourself. It has nothing to do with drinking. It even says that drinking is but a symptom. It's not the problem problem is something completely different, right? And then I go on to this next paragraph. I take them to 30 colon 3. We alcoholics are men and women who have lost the ability to control our drinking. We know that no real alcoholic ever recovers control. How often? Ever. 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 Right? All of us <laughs> felt at times we were gaining control, but such intervals were usually brief and were inevitably followed by still less control. Anybody have that experience? <laughs> I did which led in time to pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. One of my favorite sentences in the whole book. Anybody can identify with pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization? You know? Anybody can identify with that in sobriety? Or should I say, in, in sobriety? <laughs> yeah. As you, those of you who were here last night heard my story, I was sicker in sobriety than I was when I was drinking. Because I was doing things without alcohol. I had no excuse, and I was still doing it when I had double-digit sobriety. Scary. Really scary. <clears throat> All right? <clears throat> Look at this next line. It's highlighted in red. We are convinced to a man that alcoholics of our type. How do you know if you're an alcoholic of Bill Wilson's type again? Right? The only way to do it is to compare ourselves to Bill Wilson. And we're going to get to that in just a second. Alcoholics of our type are in the grip of a progressive illness. There it is right there. Over any considerable period, we get worse, never better. Does that mean sobriety? It says any considerable period, right? That's in sobriety. And if you've been around these rooms for a while, you'll see it. When we come into Alcoholics Anonymous, we're at our bottom, right? So our spiritual level's at its bottom, right? So our disease is here and our spirituality is here. Our disease continues to get worse, always. It keeps progressing, right? As long as our spiritual life progresses at least equal to our disease, they counteract each other, they offset each other. So our disease gets worse, our spirituality gets bigger. Our disease gets worse, our spirituality gets bigger. Disease, spiritual, disease, spiritual. And then we take a drink after 15, or my friend Bob from, from Marine Bob, where I live, 29 and a half years, took a drink, boom. His spirituality went to zero. Where does disease go? 
didn't move. He's got to take this ginormous spiritual leap to get back up to offset it. Otherwise, he's dead. He'll drink himself to death. That's why it's so hard after you've relapsed and you've got some experience. You need this giant spiritual leap to get back up to offset your disease because the disease keeps getting worse. I got sober at 19, folks. I was a teenager. It's 37, almost 38 years later. Can you imagine how sick I am where my disease is? And I'm working a spiritual program. When I got in to the rooms, don't drink and go to meetings was enough spirituality for me. I mean, and that's almost nothingness right there. Just the fellowship helped help me stay sober. And then it was, you got to do some service work. So I was washing dishes and cleaning ashtrays. And then it was emptying the trash and help setting up for anniversary night. And then, it, you know, you start taking on little jobs. And you become secretary or treasurer of your group. There's a little more spirituality and service work. That's why I do so much service work, on, you know, with decades of spirituality under my belt. Look in your meetings on anniversary night. Where are the old timers? You know, there's lots and lots of people, 30 days, 90 days, 60 days, a year, up to about five years. And then there's usually a gap. Then there'll be like one seven or one eight, and then there'll be another gap and a 13, and then another gap, a 17, and then there'll be a couple 20, 21, 22, 23s, and then there's another gap, and then there'll be 35s or 37s, and then another gap, and there'll be somebody at 42. Well, where the hell's all the people that filled in those gaps? Right? They're not with us anymore. They're, they should still be out there, but if you look around, we got a progressive disease, and it'll kill you. It doesn't matter how long you, you've been away from alcohol, your selfishness can come back. And if you haven't read it, I would highly encourage you to read our history books. In uh, AA Comes of Age, in the back, there's some essays. And there's essays by one of the guys that had a huge, profound effect on Bill Wilson, a guy by the name of Dr. Harry Tebow. And he specialized in the resurgence of the alcoholic ego. And he talks about the resurgence of the alcoholic ego and how you have to constantly whittle it and keep doing multiple inventories over time. Phenom mandatory reading for my guys. You know, once I've taken them through the work the first time, then I start them the second time and we go through the work the second time nice and slow, and then I have them read the history books. And I go, go read Harry Tebow. Because if you can't internalize that, you're going to relapse down the road someplace, in, in my experience. So <clears throat> back to what we're talking about. How do you know if you're alcoholic like Bill? Well, you do the Bill Wilson exercise, right? You go through the first pages of Bill Wilson's story, from pages one through eight, with a highlighter of one color. And you highlight everywhere you thought, felt, or acted like Bill. We're trying to identify, it. am I his kind of alcoholic, all right? On page eight, Bill Wilson gets sober. So you change highlighter colors. And from page eight to page 16, you highlight anything that Bill Wilson did that you are not willing to do. Because if he did something that you're not willing to do, guess what's going to kill you? We need to know about that up front. And yes, sometimes I have people that will say, you know what? I know Bill Wilson made all of his matter. matter of fact, I, I know a guy, and I don't, he wouldn't mind if I use his name. His name's Puneet. Puneet is right now in rehab for, I can't remember how many different times he's, he's been in and out and in and out. But he, he has this resentment, and he, he refuses that resentment. He'll go down the path, he'll do steps one, two, three, and we start on step four, and he keeps focusing on this resentment. He goes, well, I am not going to make a re re an amend to that SOB. And he just keeps saying, I'm not going to make it, and he keeps relapsing. And I said, you know, Puneet, you're going to lose your family. Uh, no, my, my wife's a good woman. She's not going to leave me. Guess what? This last relapse, mama's gone, man, like vapor. Pew. You know how he found out? She sent him her... Uh, her line, her login to uh, Match.com and uh, uh, what's what's that other website? Uh, oh, the hookup website, Tinder. Tinder. She sent him her Tinder profile and her, her Match.com. That's how he found out she was gone. <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah, it might might be a bottom. So yeah, he knows how to find her exactly. So. The point is, if there's something you're not willing to do, we need to know about it up front. Does anybody have any questions about the Bill Wilson exercise? If you've never done it, I don't care how long you're sober, it's a powerful exercise. Bill Wilson's story, it's perfect because he, he describes it much better than Dr. Bob. You can still do it with Dr. Bob. It's a little harder to do. but it's the, And the cool thing is, the first section of the stories in the back of the big book were from the original 100 people. You can do it with those stories, too. You can go through and you can identify with, you know, with those characters in there and start going through their stories and like, oh yeah, oh yeah, I did that. Oh yeah, I did this. You know, the home brewmeister, oh yeah, I did that. <laughs> you know, you can really connect with, with the original 100. 
you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, our founders, our co-founders, you know. JR, how much time do I have till quarter after? Uh, yeah. Quarter after? Okay, cool. We'll keep on moving. All right. Here's some important lessons that come from Bill Wilson's story. At this point, I go through these pages and paragraphs <clears throat> just to make sure the guy understands this. It doesn't have anything to do with physical craving, but we don't go past an instruction or some important piece of information without me pointing it out to him. This is first uh, from page 13, colon 5. My friend promised when these things were done, I would enter upon a new relationship with my creator. Notice the creator's capitalized. Anytime you find a word in the middle of a sentence that's capitalized, it's either a formal name or they're talking about God. All right, a relationship with my creator, that I would have the elements of a way of living which answered how many? All, All of my problems. How is that for a promise? Everybody likes to focus on the nine step promises, which are cool, they're, they're good stuff. But there's so many better promises than just the nine step promise. And one of my goals this weekend will be to point them out to you. Cool. Uh, are there requirements in Alcoholics Anonymous? Yes. Absolutely. Let's see what they are. 13 colon 5. Number one, belief in the power of God. Wait a minute. I thought you didn't have to believe in God. It's not what our book says. Belief in the power of God. You notice you don't have to believe in God. What do you have to believe in? Power, power right? Because what do we need? We need a power greater than ourselves, right? So if you don't believe in God, you know, if, or if God is, your, is a doorknob, well, is a doorknob going to restore you to sanity? I don't think so. But power can restore you to sanity, you know? And I've had people tell me, I had one guy said, is my, the power greater than myself is my cat D8 bulldozer. I'm like, a D8 is your, is your power greater than yourself. Can your bulldozer restore you to sanity? And he got this look on his face he's like, well, it's, I can choose whatever I want. I'm like, yeah, you can. Good luck with that. Let me know how it works out for you. <clears throat> you know? So I digress. Belief in a power greater than myself. <laughs> Plus enough willingness. There it is again, right? Willingness. Honesty and humility to establish and maintain a new order of things were essential requirements. Right there out of the book. There are requirements in Alcoholics Anonymous. I can't tell you how many times that they say there's no, there are no requirements in Alcoholics Anonymous. Yeah. You know, you don't, there's no, nothing you have to do. The, the book is full of have tos. It's full of musts. You must do this. And it's full of nevers. What's a never? That's a negative must, right? You can't, you never can do that. You gotta stay on this side of the road, right? You know, there's have tos. There's all kinds of amazing things in the book, but I digress. 14 colon six, my friend emphasized the absolute necessity of demonstrating these principles in how many? All, all my affairs. That means at home, folks. That's why we're going to talk about practicing these principles at home later on in this workshop. There's not enough. They call, when I got sober, they called them AA angels and at-home devils. You know, there was, there was an old timer in, in my old home group that I, don't, I think he had like 35 years, right? And when you talk to him, he seemed like he was working a great program. But until you started to delve into really discussing with him and his wife had left him, they weren't divorced, but she was in a different state and had been there for 10 years. None of his kids wanted to have anything to do with him, wouldn't talk to him, you know. I mean, the, the warning signs and evidence was all over this guy's life, that he wasn't practicing the principles in all his affairs. But he sure as hell knew this book, and he could quote it page and verse sitting in an AA meeting, you know. But I don't, I shouldn't, probably shouldn't say this, but I didn't want anything the guy had, you know. But I digress. <clears throat> uh, one more. 14.6. Particularly, was it what? Imperative. Imperative. Look up that word. I've started a number of groups called dictionary groups where we put a dictionary on the table. And when we get to a word like that, we'll stop and look up a word. It's amazing the meaning of the words when you don't understand what they mean. It, it's powerful, powerful stuff. We don't have time to go into all the different definitions here, but imperative is a really important word to look up. It was imperative to work with others as he had worked with me. Faith without works was dead, he said, and how appalling and true for the alcoholic. Why did I put down there, that down there? Because I run into meetings all the time with people with one year, two year, five years. I ran into a guy the other day with eight years in the program and he never had sponsored anybody. And when I said, why are you? Because at, at our meetings, we say, anybody willing to be a sponsor, raise your hand at the end of the meeting. And his hands go up and his hand didn't go up. And he's sitting right next to me and I, I went up to him after the meeting. He said, why didn't your hand go up for sponsorship? Oh, I can't sponsor anybody. I haven't been sober long enough. I don't have anything to give them. I was like, what are you kidding me? All you got to be is one page ahead of the guy in the big book. He's like, well, I'm afraid of hurting him. I'm like, dude, you can't hurt him any more than alcohol has. Give it a shot. <laughs> what are you afraid of? You know? And one guy, uh, just this, this uh, 
It was this week. Yeah, one of my one of my guys, Ravi. He's a phenomenal guy. Guy's just taken like a duck takes to water, right? Took him a couple years to get his wife back on board, and she finally believed that he's. She calls him Ravi 2.0 because he's just changed dramatically. She's like, I don't know who this man is now that I'm married to, but he, I really like this version. He's really awesome. And he finally got his first sponsee, and I got this text. He's like, Hey, Dave, I got a sponsee, and he's just over the moon over it it's and he's getting a front row seat to watch this guy get better and he's like wow this is just the complete deal now because i'm carrying the message to another alcoholic if you're not carrying the message guess what you're not working alcoholics anonymous plain and simple sorry to, sorry to break your bubble but that's just the way we go all right cool clock we're good all right here's my next statement We've already started to talk about this. The selfish program. One of my pet peeves when I hear that in meetings. Well, it's a selfish program, right? Another one of my pet peeves. Well, it's progress, not perfection. Do you guys hear that in meetings? Or is it just me? That's a misquote, guys. We claim spiritual progress, not spiritual perfection. Whenever I hear, well, it's progress, not perfection, it's immediately following somebody that wants me to co-sign their bullshit. Pardon my language. You know, well, you know... <clears throat> I just got caught. My wife just left me because she caught me banging my secretary. But it's progress, not perfection. I'm like, whoa. Where's the spirituality in cheating on your wife, dude? No. We're not going to co-sign that crap. Sorry. Go somewhere else. That's not going to fly in my home group. Sorry. You know? Stop sp when I got sober, they used to hurt your feelings when you were new. You know? And I, my arm would go up. My sponsor would be sitting right next to me. He'd grab my arm and yank it down. He goes, you got nothing to share, kid. You know, and then when I could finally share, I'd raise it up and go, what are you going to say? You go, don't spread your disease around here. You know, and it hurt my feelings. <laughs> you know, but they love me enough to tell me the truth. But I digress. All right, let's see about this selfish program. For if, remember I said to focus on the words if. If an alcoholic failed to perfect, number one, and enlarge. You gotta perfect your spiritual life and then make it get bigger. Remember I said it, it, your disease is getting bigger so your spiritual life has to get bigger otherwise you're gonna relapse. That's one of the single greatest mistakes I see in recovery is people get a spiritual program and they don't enlarge it. They just keep doing it, it becomes like rote. There's nothing new, there's no new marrow on that bone. They're just chewing the same and they're just going like a robot through their, their prayers. It's just robotic. And I'm like, you're gonna get drunk if you keep that crap up. You got to grow spiritually. And it doesn't mean you have to be doing 12-step work in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. Go volunteer at an animal shelter. Hop on an airplane and go to the Bahamas. They can use all the help they can get. Would you touch briefly on the phylokalia? Oh, the phylokalia. Phenomenal. Does anybody in here know what the phylokalia is? Phylokalia is something that Jay and I, are, and I have been chewing on for a long time. And it's in Christianity, you've got a bunch of books that were written that were put into the Bible, right? And a lot of them happened between 100 BC and 300 B, uh, excuse me, AD. After Jesus, 100 AD to 300 AD. After Jesus died, they started writing these stories. Well, the Christianity started to spread like wildfire in the Middle East region. <clears throat> and there was these guys called the Desert Fathers who took their spirituality and they literally would go into caves and stuff and they'd spend all day praying and meditating. And they were these prolific writers and they wrote in Sanskrit and they wrote in Greek and their readings were translated eventually into Italian and Latin, excuse me, Latin and then Italian and then translated in English. And not all of the Philokalia has been translated in, in, into English, but there's these phenomenal writings of these early desert fathers that are, that are written. And we, Jerry and I, and I started reading through them and I got a book and we'll go through there and it'll be like, uh, you know, this, St. Charles the 17th, you know, and you look down and it's like 520 AD. And in there, he's describing the, the uh, you know, drinking as like trying to swim across a river when you're exhausted. And I mean, it's just this tremendous spiritual stuff and their spiritual principles. And it was true 2,000 years ago as it is today. Spiritual principles, spiritual truth is truth, period. End of story. Yes, ma'am. No, neither. The, it's called, actually, the, the name of it is called the Philokalia. P-H-E-I-L-O-K-A-L-I-A, I think it is. If you send me an email, by the way, guys, my email address is really difficult. It's aadave1 at aol.com. Don't forget the one. I feel sorry for poor aadave. He gets unbelievable emails. <laughs> aadave1 at aol.com. If you send me an email, I'll send you a PDF file of the Philokalia. 
And what JR did, I suggest you get a, a partner like that. And I'll say, hey, JR, you got time for some file of Kalia today? And I'll go, yeah. And I'll just open up the book and we'll go through and we'll read a section. They're like little sonnets. You just read a, you know, it's like five or six sentences. And we'll, then we'll discuss the power of the spiritual principle that's in that little section. Really cool stuff. And we've been chewing on that for what, 10 years? Yeah, yeah almost, almost 10 years. Yeah. I remember exactly where Dave and I were the day we first went into the Philopoeia. And I know what it was that, that took us into that book. The true meaning of sobriety yep. from that era is where we started. Yep. And we have not gone off of that topic in almost 10 years. So that tells you the, the, the depth of the content in the five of Leo. That's what I'm saying. If you want to grow spiritually, there's unbelievable resources. Uh, Father Richard Rohr, he wrote a book called Breathing Under a Water, right? How do you breathe underwater? It doesn't make sense. It's a phenomenal book. I don't know if the guy's in, re in recovery, but he's certainly aligned with a lot of people in recovery because he uses recovery language all the time. He wrote another one called Falling Upward. Just phenomenal stuff. Um, uh, uh, Wellspring. Uh, um, Anthony DeMello. Father Anthony DeMello. Phenomenal. He, he was a, a Catholic priest. He wrote several books and did a PBS special, and then he died. Phenomenal. You could spend, on, on Wellspring, you could spend six months to a year just chewing on that. Just phenomenal resources out there. They're all over the place. Um, you know, so... Just because it's Alcoholics Anonymous doesn't mean you can't expand. It says be, be clear, uh, you know, uh, to see where religious people are right. I've read, I've read everything from Taoism, Buddhism, Shintoism, the Koran. There's spiritual truth, like I said, is spiritual truth. And it aligns. Let me put it this way. When I got sober, I didn't have a religion. I wasn't raised in religion. I wasn't raised in a church. So when they said, God, you have to find your own God, I went on a search. And I started studying everything I could get my hands on in the first probably 10 years of my recovery. <clears throat> and the one thing I learned by studying all these different religions is they're all the same and they all line up with Alcoholics Anonymous. Because every religion on the planet is identical. And it is, you're separated from God and he wants you back. That's the whole principle, is there's this power greater than yourselves and he loves you and he wants you to come back and be with him, to seek him and be in relationship with him. You know, And since we all come from the same source, that's why it's so cool when we can love on each other because it's two pieces of the same thing getting together, rekindling each other. Do you have something else, Jared? No. Cool. Uh, I got two more minutes? Yeah, and then you call the distance the length of the brain. Okay, cool. Uh, <clears throat> so I started with the Selfish Program. We covered all that whole thing? Well, that's just, just like that. Yeah. yeah, we did that quote. Now here comes the next one. Our very lives, wait a minute, our very what? Your life depends on this. Do you think that's important? You know? I don't know. For me, it's kind of important. Got my attention. Our very lives as ex-problem drinkers. Now, if you want to continue to go through the revolving door of Alcoholics Anonymous, this doesn't apply to you, right? But your very life as an ex-problem drinker depends on how often? Constant thought of others and how we may help meet their needs. That's what my morning meditation was about, was how to meet other people's needs. How to show up and, and make somebody else's life a little bit better. And it doesn't take but about three seconds. Hey, buddy, how you doing? No, how, no really, how's your day going? Because everybody says, oh, I'm, I'm great, thanks. And when you really pry, pry into it, oh, you don't want to hear about that is usually the next sentence. Oh, I, you don't want to hear about that. And I'm like, no, I really, I do. What's going on in your life? Tell me about it. Dave, yeah? I, don't, I think you went on to what they are with Santa. I don't really know if you finished the selfish part. Oh, the selfish one, the first quote? All right, we'll do it again. 14 colon 6, for if an alcoholic failed to perfect and enlarge his spiritual life through work and self-sacrifice for others. Self-sacrifice for others. Key piece of recovery. He could not survive the certain trials and low spots ahead. If he did not work, he would surely drink again. If he, if he drank, he would surely die. Then faith would be dead indeed with us. It's just like that. Critically important. If you've ever had somebody in your life die on you, if you've ever gone through a divorce, if you've ever lost your job, something where the whole world seems just like it stopped on a dime and you can't figure out which way is up, this will save your butt. Because if you're volunteering, you're self-sacrificing, somebody calls you on the phone, that little knucklehead you met on Friday at the meeting the week before calls you up on the phone and you're like, you look at the caller ID and you're like, oh God, I don't want to talk to this idiot. 
But then you pick up the phone and you have this wonderfully powerful spiritual experience and you forgot all about the fact you just lost your job or your wife just walked out the door or whatever the problem du jour was, right? It can, it, and as our book says later on, it says it works when all other activities fail. It doesn't quantify it. It just says it always works for us. Self-sacrifice for others. Look at the people that are volunteering their time to go to the Bahamas this week. It's right in front of our face. You know, they're volunteering. They're getting on boats and they're, they're, they're just doing what they can. You know, it's the old starfish theory. You know that story about the, the little kid walking down the beach and she's chucking the starfish back into the, that have washed up on the sand and her grandfather looks down and goes, well, you know, darling, you're not going to be able to get all the starfish. It doesn't really matter. You're not going to save them all. And she says, well, it matters to this one, right? <clears throat> That's the theory. These people are doing whatever they can. It may not be much, but they're doing something. And it's one of my favorite expressions is you can never give away as much as you get by giving it away, right? It's just the coolest thing, you know? Get in the habit of doing it and watch how your life doesn't just blossom and explode. Really, really cool stuff. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> Anybody heard about the 24-hour program, right? Isn't that what we're told in AA? I just don't drink 24 hours at a time. There's a guy <laughs> in my group. He says, well, because I didn't get drunk yesterday and I'm on a good path for today, I'm probably not going to get drunk tomorrow. And I sit there and I scratch my head going, what? <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm giving a daily reprieve. I, don't, I can't forecast what's going to happen for tomorrow. And, and everybody in, start, loves to talk about how we just don't drink 24 hours at a time. Is that what our program actually says? No, not at all. This is what our program says. There is, however, a vast amount of fun about it all. So, some, I suppose some would be shocked at our seemingly worldliness and levity, but just underneath there is a deadly earnestness. Faith has to work 24 hours a day in us and through us or we perish. Right? If you're not willing to step into the river, you're not going to get it. Well, let, me, let me describe that expression. A lot of people don't understand. <clears throat> Is everybody familiar with the story of Moses leading the, the Jews out of Israel? All right, Moses leads the Jews out of Israel, but the, as soon as he goes, <coughs> leaves them for a little bit, they, they, he goes up to get the Ten Commandments at the top of the, uh, the mountain, and the people start making a golden calf. Now, they just got released after all these years of bondage, hundreds of years of bondage by the Egyptians, and now all of a sudden they're making a golden calf. Did they not understand what happened? He parted the Red Sea. God realizes this whole group is corrupt. So he marches them around the desert for 40 years and 40, 40 nights until he kills off an entire generation. He says, maybe the next generation will be good enough, right? <clears throat> and he tells Moses, because Moses took credit for some of God's miracles, he says, you're not going to the promised land. And so one day it's time for them to go to the promised land. It's 40 years later, right? And Moses, God has already told him, you're not going. So he, Moses goes up to the top of the hill to watch him, and the priests are all carrying the Ark of the Covenant, right? And they're heading towards the Jordan River, and Israel's on the other side of the Jordan River. But it's springtime. And the river is at flood stage. The snow melt has happened. I mean, it's just a raging friggin' river. And these guys have this golden chest full of the Ten Commandments. And the priests are walking up and they're, they pause for a second. They're looking at each other like, what are we going to do here? And the moment the first priest had the faith to step in the river, the water stopped. And they walked across on dry land to get to the promised land. With us, it is just that. Faith has to work in and through us. You can have all the faith in the entire planet sitting in that chair and you're a dead person. You have to step out on faith. That's where that expression comes from. We must step out on faith. It means taking a leap. We don't know how it's going to work out, but you take the step anyway. For those of you who heard my story last night, when I went into that NTSB hearing, before I walked in the door, my boss had come to me and said, you know, it's your word against theirs. You're, you're saying that this happened and they're saying that that happened. He goes, I got a letter of termination here. If something doesn't come out in this hearing, you're terminated. And that's how I walked in. I said, well, okay, I'm going to step out on face. Now, the union came to me and the union said, uh, keep your mouth shut. And I said, listen, I won't lie for anybody. If they ask me what time it is, I won't build them a clock. But if they ask me what time it is, I'm going to tell them what time it is. I'm going to tell the truth. And we got into that hearing, and the questions started coming, and I started answering the questions truthfully. And, of course, the other, guy, other guys started to lie. You know, and I just stepped out on faith. I said, okay, God, if I get terminated today, I get terminated today. You know, <clears throat> and then they got caught in their lie. And all of a sudden, everybody realized, wait a minute, he's telling the truth. They're all lying. And the result was they all got fired, and I had got a letter of commendation in my file because I stepped out on faith. It could have cost me my career, but I was willing to take that hit because I was going to stand on truth. 
Our job is to get into the sunlight of the Spirit and stand in the sunlight of the Spirit, right? <clears throat> There's a biblical line, and I hate to keep going back to the biblical, but this is where the program came from, was first century Christian principles. And it comes from the book of Matthew. And it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all else shall be added unto you. It, to me, describes the entire program of Alcoholics Anonymous in one sentence. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. In other words, connect with God in his kingdom spiritually, right? And his righteousness, stand on truth. Take the leap of faith and stand in the sunlight of the Spirit. And then God takes care of everything else. You don't have to worry about your job. You don't have to worry about your health. You have to seek God and do what God tells you to do. And he'll take care of everything else. And I've experienced it for decades now in recovery. It all hinges on faith. You've got to step out on faith. Cool. That's enough for now. Why don't we come back in uh, at quarter of? We're gonna, or we'll fire it back up. We'll give you guys a chance to get a smoke break, go to the bathroom, whatever.